Welcome to the final video in this series. I'm Rutsia Yarakova of Kodasip Marketing. And I'm Rodi Urkut, also of Kodasip Marketing. Good to be back on the video series. We started off the series with Kodasip's Risk 5 portfolio, which includes a variety of commercially licensed cores from Kodasip and Western Digital's open source Swerve course. And then we have looked at some factors involved in choosing a processor core, such as performance, complexity, whether you need an operating system, and how PPA numbers are influenced by a compiler. During the series, Codesib has launched its first application processors, and we have looked into that too. So I have a few more questions to conclude the video series. Something we have not covered is why use RISC-V in the first place? I can think of three main reasons. First and foremost, RISC-V is an open standard. Most commercial um, ISAs belong to a single company. Instead, RISC-V, though, belongs to the RISC-V International, which is an association based in Switzerland. Members can contribute to the further development of the standard, and since it doesn't belong to a single company, there is no danger that the ISA will suddenly disappear due to an acquisition, as could be the case with a commercial ISA. The second thing is RISC-V is flexible. What do I mean by that? Well, firstly, there is a very small base integer ISA, which has to be there, but then you have optional standard extensions and RISC-V even allows for custom extensions, which you could say are non-standard. So you only need to use the base integer set plus whatever else you need and nothing more than that. Compare that with some of the alternatives on the market. With x86, you have a very, very large ISA, which may be suitable for some applications, but not others. In fact, the ISA has been growing in complexity over the years. And in 35 years, it grew fourfold in complexity. There's a similar situation with R, which has gone through various generations of instruction set architecture. And in fact, today, the Cortex-A, Cortex-R, and Cortex-M families use mutually incompatible instruction sets. One advantage of RISC-V then is that the same ISA applies to both embedded and application cores. The third factor is that RISC-V is designed for longevity. What I mean by that is once part of the instruction set is ratified, it is also frozen. So to, to give you some examples, the base integer instruction sets for 32 bits and 64 bits are frozen, along with a number of standard extensions. Now, there are other standard extensions in development, so over time, more and more of these will be ratified and frozen. So what are the benefits? One is software can have a very long lifetime. You can literally plan for decades of use. And your investment is preserved even if you change your processor vendor or you change a product generation. Even in the bad case of a processor vendor going insolvent, your investment should be preserved. So you've got no dependency on your processor vendor. Instead, you've got source code portability and you've got binary portability for the same combination of extensions. So what is the difference between a RISC-V core using a commercial license versus one on an open source license? Good question. RISC-V is a standard for ISA. It doesn't cover or standardize microarchitecture or licensing models. So the licensing models are open to the people who develop the cores. And at Codacip, we've developed our own risk five cores using our studio tool, and we've licensed them commercially. However, our partner, Western Digital, they've open sourced their Swerve cores, and we've collaborated with Western Digital on providing a support package to enable people to deploy these open source cores. So if we look into these licensing approaches in a little bit more detail, let's start by thinking of the classic um, commercial IP license. 
with a proprietary instruction set. So you pay a fee here for the license, and this includes paying for the ISA, for the microarchitecture, and with that you get warranty and indemnification. In contrast, with an open source IP license, you don't pay any fees. So you don't pay for the ISO or the microarchitecture, but you also don't get warranty and indemnification. Now, a RISC-V commercial IP license is something in the middle. You're not paying for the ISO because that's free, but you pay for the microarchitecture and you get a warranty and indemnification with it. So these are just alternative models in the risk five world. Finally, what would you recommend people think about when choosing a processor core? Well, in, earlier in the video series, we looked at a number of different things to think about. And I would sum them up by saying, really, you need to know your requirements and understand them and then take a thorough rather than a superficial um, comparison between the candidate processor cores and the requirements you've defined. Can you be more specific? So thinking about your requirements, there are four main things I would suggest. Firstly, what sort of software are you needing to run? What are your applications? Do you need an operating system? And if you need an operating system, is it a real-time operating system or a rich OS such as Linux? Secondly, what sort of performance are you looking for? Are you looking for continuous performance as you might, for example, in a virtual reality application? Or are you wanting performance to take place within a certain energy or time budget? You'll almost certainly need to have a silicon budget for cost reasons, and you'll probably have some power constraints. Then, when you're looking at different cores, you need to be realistic. Most vendors, when they give out PPA data, they give you um, data based on cores in isolation, which makes sense from the vendor's point of view. However, when you're using a core in a system, you need to consider the overall subsystem. So not just the core, but the instruction and data memory, peripherals and caches if you have them. Performance is often quoted using synthetic benchmarks, but you need to use these with great care. They may give you a very simple number, but if the benchmark doesn't reflect what your applications are gonna be doing, it's not giving you useful information at all. Secondly, with synthetic benchmarks, there is a high dependency on the compiler switches that are being used. So if you're comparing different processor cores, you need to be sure that you're comparing like with like. Vendors may use different combinations of switches to achieve the numbers that they publish. And last but not least, with switches, you need to be sure that you are measuring things in a way that would make sense when you actually generate code for your system on chip. It's no good using sets of switches which would give you unrealistic performance and unfortunately very large code size if that's not what you're going to use. So be realistic. Last but not least, you need to check that your processor core is well verified. Processor verification is complex and verification makes the difference between a good quality core and a poorer one. Uh, thanks for joining us today and for the earlier part of this series. There will be a new video series coming soon. If you want more information about Codacy, please visit our website or contact us by email. Thank you very much for watching this video. You can learn more about Codasip and Codasip solutions by visiting our website at www.codasip.com or by scanning the QR code here. You can also reach out to us directly by emailing contact at codasip.com. If you found this video and video series to be useful, please take a moment to click the like button below. We would love to have you subscribe to us on YouTube or LinkedIn, and of course you can share this series with your colleagues. We are honored that you took the time to watch this series and we hope you have a great rest of your day.